Welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm so glad you're here with us for Native Plants at Noon. I hope you're all staying as cool as possible on this steam sauna of a day. Um, thank you for spending a little bit of time with us uh, here over the lunch break. Uh, we'll get started here as quickly as we can. As a quick reminder, if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A uh, tool on Zoom um, or into the comments on Facebook. Uh, I can much more easily find them there. The Zoom comment field uh, tends to get lost a little easily, and we do want to get as many of your questions answered as we can today. Before we get started, I'd like to give a big appreciation to the Missouri Department of Conservation for their partnership on this series. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters, two people who are definitely having a hot girl summer, whether they want to or not. Alex yeah. Daniel and Sydney Ross are the native landscape specialists at the Anita B. Gorman uh -huh. Conservation Discovery Center. And we're so pleased uh -huh. to have them with us, Alex and Sydney. Hello, how's everyone doing today? That's Hi. a rhetorical question because you can't answer us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sydney and this is Alex. Hello. And we are both uh, native landscape specialists here at the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center in Kansas City off 47th and Troost. Um, it's a hot one today. It's hot today. Hot. We're trying to uh, 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 try to make it a challenge for ourselves. <laughs> extreme yeah. sport. Yeah, yes. it's an extreme sport being outside right now. <laughs> yeah, which actually brings up a good point. So um, we thought today would be kind of nice to talk about um, different tips and tricks for being able to stand the heat um, and being outside uh, because this time of year, there's actually some really amazing plants that you can see in uh, your local uh, prairies and other conservation areas, but it's so hot and there's so many bugs. So what are some tips? Um, Alex, yeah. you've been really good about coming up with ideas uh, for us to stay cool even here while we're at work. So yeah, I've, well, I've learned my limits uh, working outdoors for in summers in the Midwest for the last few years. Oh. Um, so we, we, we were go we went out to uh, Kill Creek on Sunday, Kill Creek Park in, Gorgeous. in Kansas. Awesome prairie and, plants right yes, now. Yes, awesome prairie. And so now is the time to get out on your remnant prairies in your area, whether that be maybe Jerry Smith Park, just another plug up throw out there for another yep. great prairie to visit. Um, any, any, any sort of prairie right now is the place to be. We're going to show you so many awesome prairie plants. So when you're going out there to see them, remember, stay hydrated. Bring, we even bring lots of cooler, extra water. Yeah, yeah. extra water. We jugs of water. Jugs, ice. Yep. We bring rags, like frozen wet rags, rags, wet rags. rags. Yeah, mm -hmm. always, always nice to have some Ooh. something cold when you get yeah. back to the car. Lots of sunscreen. So much um, sunscreen. I get burnt all the time. Like even if I put sunscreen on, because I just sweat so yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and you're fair. You're and I'm fair. fair. <laughs> I get pink. So yeah, I have to reapply sunscreen like every hour. So just, yeah. it's really, uh, you know, it's a hundred degrees in Kansas city today. It's going to be even hotter tomorrow. Yeah. Um, we but, don't recommend going out to a prairie. Maybe today or two, maybe this weekend. Well, and, the gonna yeah, be this weekend. Cool. early morning and dusk are great times also to visit. Uh, don't go in the, don't go at noon. No, don't go, at <laughs> don't go um, after between like noon and uh, five o'clock. I would say maybe try to do it either a lot earlier or just before the sun goes down. Yeah. Um, so another so. thing to remember is bug protection oh, out yeah, there that's because right. you can get covered in ticks, ticks, mosquitoes, mosquitoes chiggers, chiggers, all sorts yeah. of things. So yeah. what we do when we're hiking anywhere during this time of year um, and most of the year is um, we use bug spray. Um, we're, we're going to be getting into permethrin um, yes. later this year, which mm -hmm. is a more extreme measure you can take to protect yourself from ticks. And it involves mm -hmm. treating your clothes with permethrin. Right. And um, we, but another thing we do to keep uh, uh, safe from spe spe specifically ticks we're talking right. about here is we tuck our socks into our shoes and we'll go to yep. the extreme of like wrapping duct tape around backwards on our right. ankles, sticky side is, out. Yeah, yeah, which is a cool trick. And then you can but catch the ticks. You will see as, how many ticks that might yes. come into contact, which could be a little intimidating. Yeah, because mostly ticks are crawling up from the tips of edges of. Grass. grass or from the ground and so they're crawling up your pants right. and then yeah if they can get caught they don't fall seat. from trees they grow they yeah. crawl up from plants um yeah oh yeah and so also um another sun sorry i see a really cool bee another sun um thing is to wear a hat i hated wearing hats i had to wear my hair up but now i'm converted because <laughs> it's just too hot to be out here so yeah anyway stay, stay yeah. safe stay safe but it's totally worth it we're gonna show you some plants that are gonna inspire you obviously come visit us here our building is open during the day and on saturdays so 
it's yeah. a great place to come and enjoy these plants with a chance to cool down right and take breaks yeah. right and yeah. we would love to show you around in person so if yes. you're in the area come visit us yeah okay so now we're going to jump into plants uh there's so yeah. many awesome summer plants in bloom i feel like every day i'm seeing something new um so i'm going to turn the camera over to alex and uh we're gonna get started here so speaking of hot girl summer right sydney <laughs> what what kind of plant okay. what, what kind of plant do you think we could talk about so this is i i know i get like really excited about <laughs> plants and i i feel like every day i'm saying this is my new favorite plant but <laughs> this is a poppy mallow um is this bush or fringe poppy mallow? this is um this is um um um, um purple poppy mallow purple there's poppy also mallow. bush there's poppy a, mallow three. and fringe okay yeah. yeah so this is just a uh, purple poppy mallow and i it's also known as like wine cups people mentioned that um, shout out to Patty Ragsdale. We yeah. talked about it uh, the other day, but these are just, they're gorgeous. Ground, they're ground cover, but you can see they also do really well um, with support around them. I think they're be especially beautiful when they climb up through plants um, and along the edges. So actually, if you look over here, it is, it is working really nicely with this river oats, which is, again, a plant we don't recommend planting in a small formal situation because it's too aggressive. But Purple poppy mallow is a great addition to your garden because um, you can see how it just kind of climbs up and reaches for the sun. It's got that intense magenta color. It is a full sun plant um, and it thrives with the heat. So in the front of our building, if you come visit us, you will see um, that we have purple poppy mallow in like the middle of a concrete area. It's a total heat island and it's it looks stunning. So that's what you'll see when you first come to the Discovery Center is just an ocean of this purple poppy mallow. Yeah, and can I say one yeah. other thing about like, and you can see it right here growing on the sidewalk. It's doing just fine in this heat yep. with the heat bouncing off of the sidewalk, like it can take it. And also we, this this plant, I love to recommend for edges that are, that can be mowed up against because this plant can take damage. It can take That's lots good. of damage. It can get mowed and it'll come back. If they get too long and stop sending out resources. Oh, Sorry, <laughs> you have a friend. Is that a crab spider? <laughs> it's like a neon yellow crab spider. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 so they they will. Um, you can cut them all. We'll do this at least once a year for ours. Um, to refresh them, we will cut them all the way back to the. Let's uh, show the base right here is one of them. Oops. So just down here. Yeah, cut them all the way to the base, like that, and then they can um, they'll resprout. That's great. Um, again, yeah, and 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 refresh. Yeah, that would be really nice because um, you mentioned like they can handle being cut and everything. So like I'm thinking ah. if you have your garden and then on the edge is like lawn, right? So yeah, if, even if it crawls out and you end up having to weed whack or mow it, yeah, it'll bounce right back. In an urban situation, it's right? it's so nice because you can have it yeah. up against the sidewalk where it could get weed eaten, yeah. it could get mowed, whatever. It can get trampled too. I'm also um we've got some pots, uh, some container gardens and. Um, I've stuck a, a few of these into a container and I think it looks really beautiful with, um, um, oh gosh, uh, cor Lanceleaf Coreopsis and Indian Plantain. I think those are kind of a cool combination. Yeah, I can't wait to see that idea, pot. So. Yeah, <laughs> so they're, they're, a, they're a spiller. If, a if, you're, if you're thinking of pot. You need a fill, a thrill, and a spill. And they're so. a spill, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so All right. Prairies though. Um, uh, something that you will see in abundance of right now in a variety of are milkweed. So this is common milkweed. And I had no idea, oh my gosh, how fragrant they smell. They smell like clovers to me, but they're giant. Look at those nodding flower heads. Um, I can see ants on them getting nectar. I see these really cool, are these milkweed beetles? Yeah, oh, those are milkweed I love their beetles. little antenna and they, they're, they've Look at got the... such a beautiful coloring. Um, so they're sorry they all benefit from the milkweed but of course the poster child of pollinators and native plants uh, if you don't know is are the monarch butterflies and uh, they have developed this special relationship with milkweed over hundreds of thousands of years um, so monarch caterpillars need to have this plant in order to survive uh, it's their host plant it's the only food source that the caterpillars eat so as you as you're looking out in your backyard maybe you have milkweed or out in prairies Keep an eye out, uh, not just for the monarch butterflies visiting the plants, but check for eggs that you can find on the bottom of leaves and even caterpillars starting to hatch and eat this plant. Yeah. Um, and kind of a cool thing about uh, monarchs and milkweed 
is milkweed is actually a toxic plant because of the milk. I'm just gonna stick a small piece of leaf back from here. Um, so you see this like sappy milk coming out. It looks like that. It's um, actually toxic and uh, not, pre not very many uh, insects or things can eat milkweed except the monarch caterpillar. But when the caterpillar eats it, it absorbs some of the toxins and becomes toxic to predators. And so predators know by the coloring of monarch caterpillars and butterflies, hey, that's a, that is a poisonous uh, critter and I can't eat that. Um, so that's kind of interesting um, yeah. to know. Do you have anything else to add about? Yeah, milkweed. Um, I mean, milkweed has gotten bad rep for, for years and years because it was seen as a toxic plant for cattle and right. farmers eradicated it from their farms. And unfortunately, that's what was a major part of the decline of the monarch mm -hmm. is that um, all of a sudden all of its host plants were gone in the tall grass prairies in the Midwest. Right. And so we're, tra we're really trying to change that a narrative about milkweed being a weed. And one of right. the ways that we're trying to do that is come up with a better common name for this this one and common milkweed unfortunately i don't know which one where you it should be like fragrant milkweed or something fragrant. like that because it smells so good it's i think patty had an idea for what we could call it i yeah. can't remember what she said but she, um but yes this is a really really important plant and you can see it actually is pretty well behaved in this sort of more mm -hmm. um uh, uh like a small garden setting um yeah. this this is where this one is maxing out um they can get much taller in in uh in different settings but um yeah, the common overall milkweed. some other milkweeds yeah. grow shorter like butterfly milkweed or what yeah. we like to call monarchs delight we stole that phrase from who was that from doug town doug yeah. it's a great it's a much better name yeah um, it's but, yeah but but if you're yeah if you're looking for a milkweed don't be scared of this one this is, i guess what i should say because yeah. a lot of people have this uh, irrational fear around milkweed that it's going to be a giant and it's going to be weedy no, and you like, want it to spread you, you want it to. and you also want it to get eaten like you so want it to, if your yeah. plant looks decimated by the end of the season you've done a great job because it that means you have fed um insects which are also bird food in some cases except for the monarch characters but, yeah um, yeah so and you know something also think about even if it's a taller plant you can um, incorporate it by having it towards the back of your garden or the middle if it's a garden in the round. There's yeah. a lot of ways you can incorporate taller species of plants. That's together. right. That's right. Okay. Uh, well, so you want to talk? You yeah. want to switch? Let's switch okay. because there is this really cool plant uh, that I don't know okay, much about. I, I, can you get that bee? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. oh, there's actually there's all kinds of things happening here. Oh, is that a skipper and bees? I just saw a busy. skipper laying eggs on the indigo. Yeah. Okay, so here's another special prairie plant that you can see blooming right now out in um, tall grass prairies, but it's pretty easy to grow in, um, well, I should say easy. I would say rabbits love it, don't they? Yes, they do. Rabbits do love it. This is purple prairie clover. It's so tiny. It is so tiny and delicate, but if you can get this, this, this is just the first one of ours that's bloomed. If you can get this established in like a mass planting, oh boy, that would look really, really good. It's just such a bright stunner and it'll keep blooming up. You can see that the flowers have died off down here at the bottom. It'll continue to bloom up all the way through. That's really the cool. Here. Yeah. And normally this will be, this will have pollinators all over it, but I think we're even seeing the pollinators starting to <laughs> take a break for the day. It's so hot. It's so yeah. Hard. <laughs> yeah. Right. So they're chilling, but like that this will normally be ha have like little tiny bees. Yes. Like little Would this be a, so that this state's pretty small then, right? Yeah, it's that's not, as big as it gets. Okay. Half, so this could be a nice, like, um, kind of towards the front of your garden, yeah. um, and like a swath, like plant multiple plants of this so that you have one, uh, more likely not all of them will get eaten by rabbits, yeah. but, uh, so it has a little more, um, sus substance in yeah, your garden. Right. So as we, Hi everybody, seems like we're having a little bit of difficulty um, with Alex and Sydney's connection. So um, if you're wondering if it's just you, it is not. Um, I'm gonna try to get them back here just real shortly. So in the meantime, if you have any questions that have come up, um, go through the uh, Q&A, put your question there. If you see another question uh, that you also have, go ahead and click the uh, thumbs up sign and we will work on getting Alex and Sydney back in. Oh no, uh, the phone overheated. So uh, give me just one moment here and we'll see if we can get them connected with a different device.
we're serious it's hot it's hot out here even okay. my phones okay. can't even handle it well actually this is kind of a, that was kind of a great uh time for that to happen because yeah. we're walking to our next area but in the meantime does anybody have any questions that we can answer yes um so several questions about when to cut back a uh, purple poppy mallow um if your goal is to refresh the blooms yeah okay so with the one we have in the, the uh, parking lot that is in a, a true, true heat island, it's growing straight up on the concrete. It, if we, do, we just watered it today did, to yeah. keep it blooming, but once it starts to fade, if you don't water it, it will stop sending energy out to the flowers at the end and, mm -hmm. the, and the stuff out at the end. So it'll, um, it'll shut off and start to look a little bit sad. You can do it anytime. Any time during the growing season, if it gets too long, if mm -hmm. you think it looks too leggy, just cut it back. Yeah. It's going to recover. Even if it has blooms on it, you know, it, it, if yeah. you need to cut it back, put them in a vase. And not that yes. we encourage cutting wildflowers ever, but if it's in your own garden, then, you know, yeah. what you want. And um, yeah, they may, they actually last in a glass of water really well. Yeah. We put some up front, I think on uh, Saturday and they're still, or maybe Monday and they're still doing pretty well. So yeah. great question. Questions? Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Um, a couple of other questions uh, about uh, rabbits. Does rabbit repellent have any negative effect on pollinators Ooh. or other animals? Okay. So I have uh, just very limited experience with this, but um, at my house, I just did a brand new planting and I've, uh, we have a ton of rabbits. It's over in Prairie Village and I use Scram which is a brand you can get at your local um, garden center. And it is a bone and blood meal, like a powder. And then you sprinkle it around and the smell deters. And so far it's actually worked really well. Um, I don't think because it's a natural, um, it's just bone and blood, which is disgusting, but you know, it works. It just scares the predators um, or sorry, the rabbits, rabbits, which yeah. are the predators. Yeah. Plants, um, but it makes them think of predators and things. So that works well. And I don't think it, um, yeah, don't nice. use any chemical. I mean, we can I don't, never I, we don't advocate. I don't know like about liquid vents or, or anything like that, but this yeah. has worked for me and it's all natural. And as far as I know, it does not affect pollinators. Um, but dogs, oh, this is one thing. The neighbor's dog got out and was like trying to eat it. And then they looked it up and said it was okay. So maybe check into that if you have a dog. Oh yeah. They find it, it yeah. they may find it irresistible. So maybe do a little research on that before you commit to a product. Yeah, that's a good idea. And um, we, 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 another thing, or another, let's see, we have rabbits here, but what we try to do is plant so densely um, that if we, even if we lose a little bit of foliage on the tops mm -hmm. of plants, that we're not losing. What well, native plants are kind of good in that way is they can take some damage up top. Right. And they can still recover. So if you can keep them from like ripping the plant out, which is actually what yeah. squirrels will typically do, not rabbits. Well, rabbits will do it too. Yeah. But like <laughs> as long as the root structure is still there and there's like something that can get some chlorophyll into that plant, right? It will probably survive. Yeah. But that's, if they're getting really constant, point. if you only planted like three and they're getting constantly hammered. Then yeah. Like, and that's like their favorite snack. And yeah. that's what they're going to go for. And then one other thing I, I just remembered about rabbits specifically is they don't like to be in small confined spaces. So I have like, there's a really small uh, bed along the house. So we put up this like tiny, really tiny wire fence and the scram um, stuff. And it, that seems to have helped they, quite a bit. They don't want to get in a position in where they could be vulnerable to predators. So. Yeah, that's a good idea. Use yeah. their fear. Use, their, <laughs> use it against <laughs> them. Great question. What else we got? Um, let's do one more and then we can uh, save some of the others for the end. Do you have suggestions on where to find a purple prairie clover or milkweed? Yeah. So in terms of finding it out in the wild or where to purchase oh. it? Oh, I believe the questions are where to purchase. Um, and oh, I have okay. put the link to deeproots.org uh, slash find plants in to the chat. Um, yes. to help folks find their various nurseries. But if you have any suggestions where you might have seen either of those yeah, recently. Yeah, I haven't. Well, I've seen a lot of milkweed. Out, uh, if you all haven't been to Soil Service, their East Building, please go and tell them how much you appreciate having native plants. Um, because well, go to any, nurse, any of your any nursery and talk about native plants. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of nurseries have a small section. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to go? Yeah, I'm 
a lot of nurseries have small and growing sections of native plants, but it's so it's so helpful to go in and talk to the growers in there. They want to hear what you want to have, what you want to buy. So right. go in, talk to them about it. Like we say, soil service, we get a lot of plants from soil service. We always have because they've been where we're close to, but now we have so many other nurseries. And so, like Sarah said, she's linking to the list of local nurseries um, mm-hmm. in Kansas City. There's so many in Lawrence. Like, right. There's tons of Jeff City. Yeah. There's a know. ton. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Great question. Okay. That, that one I do see readily. No weed you can always find. Yeah. And you Purple. Can, you can usually yeah. find that one at most nurseries. I would yeah. say you'd be able to Just find again, it. you probably, you've heard us say this in almost every episode. Make sure you're getting the true natives. You can tell that um, a few different ways. If it is called Tropical Sunrise in quotes or any kind of frilly name like that, it's probably not a native or a true native. Um, and of course, you can always refer to the Latin, you know, just Google it um, and you can compare notes there. But we're yeah. going to move on to this flower because I'm worried this phone's also going to get overheated. We're going to lose <laughs> you again. So I have a yeah. new black case. I I, it's, it's already <laughs> getting hot. I can feel it. Okay. Um, so what time we talk about coneflower? Do you want Cone to flowers. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I want to ask you real quick. So we talk about being out in the prairies right now and I've heard something called uh prairie birthdays. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what is a prairie birthday? What does that mean? And why is it cool? Yeah. So she's from Alvin Leopold, um, uh, who wrote the San County Almanac. And, uh, he talks about how between like in the growing months, um, starting in April, every week there's about 10 new plants that are blooming in the prairie and it's so true especially yeah. here there's new plants blooming every week we 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 just walk around and we're like oh it's look who showed up to the party i know so it's always exciting it's like a birthday gift right have the special occasion of it being coneflower it's coneflower season so we have four there are lots of different coneflowers out there we have four species here and we have, they, they range in sizes. And, and bloom times, right? And bloom times, kind of. Although this year we got very lucky in that we had actual spring. Yeah. So they're all kind of lining up and blooming. At the and same overlapping, time right yeah. Yeah. So this first one right here, this is Glade Coneflower. And the one we have here, this one uh, was planted last year. So it'll get a little bit, I would say a little bit taller than this, but it's one of the shorter ones. Like with most Glade species, they're usually smaller versions of whatever the tall grass prairie um sister to them is right like in this case so this one back here looks very similar but and there's one way to tell and actually we can't do it today but i just know this because i already tried this a bunch of times (laughs) but the difference between pale purple coneflower which is this one this is pale purple and blade coneflower is the the color of their pollen Mm -hmm. um pale purple coneflower has white pollen Mm -hmm. And it's just a little bit there, but you really can't see it. The bees have really taken most of it, or the ants in this case are on this one. And the glade coneflower has yellow pollen. I can't most find of, Most of the care. pollen is gone. It's, it's mostly gone now. Another way to tell too, I think is like, well, if you see them bloom at the same time, this is easy to tell, but glade, like yeah. Alex said, glade's much shorter. It also blooms earlier. Yeah, I did end up blooming first yeah. of all, and that's why you can see it. Is that typical? Now. Is that, so does glade coneflower usually bloom first in general, or is that just kind of a special deal this because is, of weather? What had, that's what we've had here, but to be honest, this is not glade coneflower's preferred habitat you know right this is it's actually getting more than it needs here yeah so it might be a little buried in in the wild too but in in our in our in kansas city anyway we've had that one bloom first consistently <laughs> and and so then we have pale purple coral flower and then we have the i guess should we just go over it? yeah so most cone flowers are purple right or like some variation of purple yes, purplish pinkish so that's echinacea Parada- or echinacea pallida is the tall and echinacea pale purple. stimulata is the simulata is, is the simulata sorry and yeah. then we have here we have echinacea purpurea which is let me do that one first and we'll do parada so okay, okay here, here. <laughs> sorry here i'll zoom in. here so that's purpurea so that's that's purple cone flower and that is the number one everybody has to have it it should be your you have to have it start native gardening and if you don't just go ahead and add it now it's the most bang for your buck readily establishes yes. yeah this is the plant you plant this first year you have flowers you're going to get goldfinches yeah gratification goldfinches love to eat the seed heads in winter so don't deadhead it uh leave sure. the 
leave the seeds up after the flowers uh, fade back. And you'll see tons of pollinators all over it. Yeah. It's not right now because it's too hot and all the pollinators went to bed. They, they're taking a nap. Oh, I'm taking a nap after this. Yes. <laughs> okay. And then so we have that Echinacea purpurea. So here we have the last one. Echinacea. <sighs> You want to talk about this? One? Echinacea paradoxa. No, I just wanted to say the name really fast. <laughs> no, you did it. You got Thank it. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that little scare. Oh, there we left. It's so pretty. Mind. Yeah. So it, it is the Latin name paradoxa because it's like, oh, this is a paradox. Like usually purple cone flowers purple. Exactly. A. Exactly. And this is an example of why co common names are so tricky. We just experienced this with someone just a few minutes ago where they thought they had the yellow cone flower, but this is echinacea. And the yeah, the showy coneflower. Sh there's another one yeah. called showy coneflower, which is actually a rudbeckia. Yeah, it's not a coneflower, so like it's actually not at all. Yeah, yeah, you have to pay attention in this case. But this is such a stunning flower. Look at that. And we're gonna plant more of it. Next yeah, year. actually, there's a good patch behind you. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. Should we go look at that? Yeah. Oh, and there's a mix. The mix uh, that is too. But yeah, it's just cute. And I, one of the things I love about um, cone flowers is that when they get done um, blooming, their their leaves start to like, or their petals start to dry up. The ray florets start to dry up, and then they turn black, and it Ooh. looks like they were they Dramatic. were set on fire. Yes. Like it looks like they went through a burn without actually without <laughs> going, through actually going through a burn, which is so. Cool. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah, if you. If you already know about cone flowers, like that's awesome. Um, these are just some other um, types of cone flowers that you could consider adding to your garden. I um, mean, if you don't have any cone flower, get on it. Like they're so easy to grow. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much what we've got for today. We're gonna go ahead and um, set up here. So Sarah, do you have any other questions for us before we head out? I know we lost a little bit of time there for a minute. With the heat killing me. Yeah. Mind. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for rolling with the punches there, you two. Um, okay. So on uh, the the last cone flower that we showed, that's Echinacea paradoxa, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That was one paradoxa. of the questions that came up and I accidentally clicked the button on it and it went away. So I didn't want to forget about it. Um, so let's see. Ruth would like to know, how do you prevent deer and rabbits from eating your garden lots of questions about yeah what do you do about <laughs> the critters coming to the buffet yeah yeah you know part of it is that that this is what they naturally eat you know so kind of keeping an open mind about that but there are some things you can do um to help not have your garden be totally demolished um one is uh planting in abundance if you can so even if they do get the pressure from wildlife they can still there's enough of them to bounce back you could try um, organic, um, like that scram stuff. They have that brand specifically has other um, products, deer, deer yeah, repellent. Deer one, yeah, that like non toxic things. Do not poison these animals, right? They're just trying to live and survive, but it can be frustrating as a gardener. Yeah, I would say plant, yeah, planting, planting densely is your best bet. Mm -hmm. um, they're also, you can, um, we're the wrong people to talk to about this. We don't have deer here. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have rabbits are the worst thing we do. Yeah. Have. And children, of course. They, yeah, they they're trample. Very, they're kind of like deer. They smash and break <laughs> everything. But they, um, they, what we talk about is like uh, living with nature. Like mm -hmm. you're kind of inviting that in. It's such a huge thing though. And it feels so, so devastating to lose the top of your plant. But I, I promise that if you plant densely enough and keep trying, yeah. Those plants will establish themselves and they're ready for it. They're, they they're used to that. Urban they're adapted. Area. They've been, yes. they've been working with or living with uh, deer and rabbits for hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah. So just plant more stuff. Plant more things. I know that's, that's not helpful. helpful. You probably but, hate that answer, but it's also, true. Yeah. But another thing, oh, too, I just remembered. Remember, um, some people will plant like plants that deer don't like. Deer and, resistant. Yeah. Things. So yeah. like, like mints. mints. Yeah. yeah. Mints yeah. they can't eat. Um, Monardas. Yeah. Yeah. Sophiums. And yeah. there's like um, flowers, yeah. there is a good, I think through MOBOT, the Missouri Botanical Garden website, um, they have a really good list of, of, of plants that are specifically deer resistant. Yeah. yeah. You know, though, that just kind of reminded me too, even when uh, we've been talking about something called the, Ch what we call the Chelsea chop, it's like cutting plants oh. back. And then, uh, so like, well, it's a little late in the season, but like beginning of June, uh, cutting plants back and then um, they will grow, uh, regrow, rebloom, shorter, more compact. 
deer do the same thing in rabbits. They eat it and then those plants still come back. So even if you see it chomp off the top of your flower, or your chomp off the whole top of your plant, um, it's likely gonna bloom back anyway. So. Bloom back and with more blooms, more blooms and shorter. It's, super cute. I, that's funny. We it's, are yeah. our own deer. We are our deer. <laughs> be the deer you want to yeah, see. Yeah, be what? the deer. No, what? they, they, they're, they, yeah, it's, they're gonna look ugly and awkward for a little while, but we'll show in one of our later episodes hello. That we'll show cool. one of our one of our native or Chelsea Chop demonstrations of like what it looks like after you cut how many wounds we get coming right up, uh, even after that damage yeah yeah great question great question and um, another thing too is maybe buy your plants more mature than you normally oh, would that's for true. those That'll types help. of plants that, that the deer are eating mm -hmm. go ahead spend the extra money to get a two-year-old plant as opposed to a seed this tiny little plugs yeah. get the quartz or whatever yeah, yeah. That's good advice. Um, along those same lines, Gail would like to know if you can cut back coneflower early in the season to get a, a shorter, bushier plants. You can. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You can. I we don't with coneflower though because it already sort of does that. We like to promote coneflower as one of the main species here, so we're mm -hmm. usually cutting things around it right. to try and get it to um, a little more. But we, but you could do it. We just I was don't. just, I was just in the garden yesterday. Um, yes. And it looks great that she cut it back uh, probably like a few weeks ago and it's already, the bloom's already coming back, but I, I wouldn't do it probably this, like in this heat, you know, you don't want to stress the plants out too much. I know coneflowers are pretty hardy, but yeah, but you're um, also, it's too late for anything that's budding already. Right. Like, if you it's already you budding, to you gotta wait. What we're, we're, we're cutting right now in Chelsea Chup is like our asters and fall Things, bloomers yeah, fall because bloomers. they're not, yeah. our silphiums, our sunflowers, all of the plants that will bloom in mm -hmm. like September um, yeah. because they have plenty of time then to regrow Re their yeah. stocks and, um, and send energy, back. but we're, we're taking a break on it for the next two days, clearly, because that's way too much stress, too much stress. On yeah. the plant. But yeah. we'll get back to it next week. Uh, we got eighties in the forecast, yeah. so we'll get back to Chelsea Chop and, and hiking. I miss hiking. hiking. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. One last one. Uh, Joe has a question about the saying about native plants, uh, first year sleep second year creep third year leap yes. <laughs> what's the question would you about? talk a little bit about what is meant by that okay yes um so planting with perennials in general um especially natives is a long-term plan right so there are some plants that will give you that instant gratification like home flower but that phrase is to kind of set that for me uh, the way i interpret it is setting the expectation that um you know, you're going to plant it the first year and it's probably not going to be as beautiful as it will be by the third year. That first year, it's sending all its energy to its roots to get itself established. You know, native plants have deeper roots um, and work with the soil in that way. The second year, you'll start to see a little bit more growth, more blooms. And the third year is really when they blossom, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, it sets that expectation that it's not going to be, it's not like annuals, you're not going to plant it and be like, oh, like most of the time, this is a stunning, like fully mature plant. It takes some time. So that's kind of what I think about it. What about you? Yeah, it's just, it's just basically like the plant, it's, it's growing in stages. It wants to reach maturity in its best form. Yeah. So what it, when it's going to put out its mo the most energy into seed production is, is starting in that third year. Yeah. Because it, it knows that it's got its root system established. established. Yep. It's got its base foliage or whatever it right. prepped with the second year. And then the third year, it's ready to send up mature, right? To start reproducing and, um, yeah, extending the cycle to other plants. So we just got started. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. That's a phrase that comes up a lot. And it took me a while to really um, understand that phrase. Also, uh, right plant, right place. That drove me nuts. I still kind of have weird feelings about, mixed feelings about that phrase. But it's true. It's like knowing knowing where you're, where the plant is going to thrive, like what conditions this plant needs and what conditions you have in your own garden. So. Yeah, it's, and, and definitely please come visit us here. Come see what, what, what a native garden looks like after it's planted for a month, after it's yeah. planted for a half or for six months, after it's planted for three years, we can show you 
how it doesn't it does it's not full it can't be full the first year no. but by year three oh boy it's, even if it pays yeah. off so much by year three. Uh, yeah i just been we just finished planting primrose prairie which we'll talk about another time but there's 500 plants in this bed and it's still it's like it's not gonna look anything like it will in a few years so yeah just keep that in mind you're doing the work but it does take a bit of time yeah Excellent. Well, that seems like a great note to stop on. Um, Alex and Sydney, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and finish up here and hopefully you uh, will be able to remain with us uh, through that time. So we'll see. We fingers. have a cloud now. Yeah, we got cloud coverage. So that helps. <laughs> oh, good, good. So um, if you've been enjoying Native Plants at Noon, you might also be interested in attending Deep Roots upcoming online Native Plant Conference. Uh, save the date for Planet Native, which will be September 22nd through 24th. More information is available on the website, which is planetnative.org. We also have a huge library of Native Plants at Noon and our webinar recordings. Um, visit deeproots.org and click on um, webinars, uh, which is under events at the top of the screen. If you pull that down and go to webinars, um, you'll find a large library there of um, all of our previous episodes. And while you're there, we'd be grateful if you'd consider making a donation to Deep Roots as well. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Drink plenty of water. Don't forget the sunscreen. And we'll see you next month on July 15th. Thanks so much. Take care.